Hi, welcome to the ASB and ASSA's Vic South Star Party and our live stream about the prospects for the Christmas Comet. Hi, I'm Cathy. I'm John. And before we start, I'd like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of South Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We recognise them as the first astronomers on this land and their ongoing deep connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Thank you, Cathy. Um, and welcome, Michael. Hello, Michael. Good Hello. to see you here. And all of the people out there watching, hopefully there's a fair few watching. And uh, that's who I'm talking to now because we've got a raffle. We have a big raffle going that's going to be drawn tonight at 9 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, Melbourne time. So that'll be 8.30 here in Adelaide. We're broadcasting from Adelaide. Michael, whereabouts are you? Uh, Swan Hill in country Victoria. Swan Hill in Victoria. So we're a little bit apart there. Um, more about the raffle very quickly. Uh, you can find out more about it on the ASB's homepage right at the start. There's a link and it takes you to all this text about the uh, various prizes. Now, the first prize is a ultra compact equatorial tracking platform. I am reading this, so I apologize. I'm not looking straight at the camera. It's a, a massive prize. There. It's got a polar scope with illuminator, Wi-Fi with selectable modes, free control app for Android and iOS phones. And uh, it's got sidereal solar and lunar tracking with automatic DSLR shutter release control. So if you want to stick your um, DSLR on there, um, there's a whole stack of stuff there. It's uh, quite a sturdy one, so it takes about uh, 1.5 kilograms or something. So you can read more about that. So it's quite um, quite a substantial amount there. Now, if you don't get first prize, second prize is pretty good. It's a very, very large 40 inch, uh, they haven't gone metric yet, so it's a bit over a meter, telescope bag. So uh, ultra durable, 900 denier. So it's pretty thick. Um, it's it's huge looking there at the, the price there's a whole lot of things that you can put different um uh internal walls in the bag and all sorts of things it's valued at over a thousand dollars about a thousand seventy dollars and it's going to be delivered by courier to your home fully insured so how's that now you'll be notified by email but hopefully you're going to see it uh on tonight's show at nine o'clock so you can tune in on youtube or facebook for that and for this session, as you've already met, our presenter is Michael Macchiazzo. In 1986, Michael witnessed his first comet, Halley, which had him hooked on comets. Since then, he has made visual observations of over 245 comets, plus countless others imaged using a CCD camera. He joined the Astronomical Society of South Australia in 1990 and had the privilege to meet one of the greatest visual comet hunters of all time, Bill Bradfield. Discoverer of 18 comets, Bill was Michael's mentor and gave him much support in taking up comet hunting. Very good. Now, Michael, uh, we've all met uh, Bill Bradfield and uh, uh, Bill was a super nice guy, wasn't he? Can you hear me, Michael? Yeah, mate, I can hear you, yes. Yes, uh, we've, we've both met Bill, a great guy, and he's uh, passed away a few years ago now. Um, the Astronomical Society of South Australia is lucky enough to have uh, that initial, his comet hunting telescope uh, there in our possession. So uh, when you come over here, Michael, next, uh, uh, you can come and have a look at that. We're, we're sort of doing it up at the moment. But uh, I've got some more bio here that you've sent through, Michael. Although no longer hunting comets, Michael turned to searching for comets in the Swan data. Is that because you're in Swan Hill? <laughs> uh, me, me coincidence it is, oh is it okay no that's from the soho satellite uh michael's got a tally of nine swine swan comet discoveries to your name nine um uh, and of course we already know that you live in swan hill that's on the river murray for those people watching overseas murray river is the longest river in south australia and swan hill sort of about halfway along from the mountains down to the ocean down here at uh, gore where it comes out um, you also submit astrometric data of comets to the Minor Planet Centre under Observatory Code Q38. What's Q38, Michael? Is that where your place is? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, backyard. <laughs> in the backyard. So it sounds very technical, but it's just the backyard. So fantastic. So can you take us through all the stuff you do in your backyard now? Over to you, Michael. Uh, yeah, what I do in the backyard, basically I, I use a, um, a C11 Reichmann Schmidt Astrograph telescope. Uh, I, I actually don't even have an observatory. I just drag it out of the back, out, out, you know, outside the house and uh, plonk it plonk it down, line her up to the uh, South Lestial Pole, um, whack a Canon 6D camera on it, and you know, 15 minutes later, away you go. That's so pretty quick. That's pretty much it, yep. Okay. Um, well, do you want to take us through, I guess you're going to take us through some of your discoveries. And so you've, you've got the telescope outside. It's not raining, which is uh, what I was doing last night over there, I think. Um, you what do you do so you, you, you so you're basically referring to the swan the swan discoveries yes yes but what about well, your well, own basically well, you can talk about both yeah yeah well, well with the swan discoveries you, you pretty much i spend about five minutes a day looking at the data from the um from the uh, soho swan website um so they basically provide a um their their data in comet tracker map format uh, it's it's an ultraviolet camera in space. Um, it's very low resolution, but it but it's very good at picking up comets because they they shine brightly in the ultraviolet. So once once I think I detect something in there, I'll I'll then uh, race out um, if if it's visible oh. from my hemisphere. <laughs> I'll race out and um, image the image the area where the uh, the object. Yeah, you, you sort of know where it, where it might be within a few degrees. So it's a so it's a very narrow sort of area of search. So it's a lot easier than spending hours upon hours of photographing the night sky and never find anything. So a bit like a bit like Bill Bradfield did. He didn't have that. Very much. So um, so these version. these discoveries these discoveries in no way compare to the efforts that Bill Bradfield. He he basically um you know got up at three in the morning, dragged his scope into the car, drove out. Mm kilometers kilometers to get to find some dark sky and spend hours upon hours upon hours of visually hunting so he, did, he got 18 didn't he bill 18 yes copies. yes yep that's amazing yeah, but he he's he sort of he done it at the, in a time when he had uh, he didn't have much competition pretty much like or southern hemisphere based for a start well, you um, weren't there true <laughs> but today in today's day and age um the, the skies are literally covered by professional surveys, so so the comets are discovered when very far from the sun now. So it's a, it's a much much more difficult task to find a comet for an amateur. That is, so mm. it's um, yeah, that's 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 where it's um, that's where the challenge is at. <laughs> so hence hence why I gave up visual hunting in favour of the uh, the swan searching for swan comets in their data. Do you feel, Michael, this is a bit of a loaded question, do you feel like you're sort of cheating a bit when you do it this way? Well, well, it's not necessarily cheating because it's you don't, you don't get your name attached to it. So so none of my finds have, have got Matty Adza on it. They basically got uh, SWAN, the label is Comet SWAN, which is um, where the prime detection occurred. Mm. But you're a footnote. I just, get, I just get the I just get the discovery credit for it. Mm, that's pretty good. So, Michael, you're going to speak to us today about the Christmas comet. What's the um the scientific designation for that one? The C five. How does it go? C twenty twenty one A one Leonard. Yep. What's all that mean? So, Can you get, take us through the no med no med? Yeah, yeah, chart? I will. That's all part of the. That's all part of my talk. <laughs> okay, right. we'll, we'll be quiet. You take it away. <laughs> yes. Don't worry. Okay. So, how, so you're sharing the screen, seeing that? Yep, we can see that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. See so a green dot. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Just a green dot at the moment. Yeah. Green dot. So basically, this this is an image of uh, Comet Leonard that I've taken remotely a couple of days ago um, from New Mexico using an eye telescope. Now it's um, it's this is also a C11 Rasa. Uh, and it's about a 10 minute exposure <coughs> using their T68. Um, so it's currently only visible in the Northern Hemisphere um, and it's still 
still a couple of months away from uh, perihelion. So, so when this photo was taken, it was about 1.7 astronomical units from the Earth. Um, and this, this distance will, will shrink very rapidly over the next six weeks. So, yeah, so before I talk about Comet Leonard, I basically need to go to the, go to the basics and just um, explain what a comet is. Actually, when you talk about six weeks, that's pretty scary. That Christmas is coming up pretty quick. True story. Uh, very true story. I just uh, when I, I just did the calculation then, and heck. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So you see on screen here, what? So uh, on the right hand side here, we've got the Rosetta spacecraft. Um, um, that basically orbited comet uh, 67P Churyov. Sorry, Churyumov Gerasimenko, uh, which was discovered in 1969 by a couple of Russian astronomers. So, yeah, the Rosetta spacecraft um, orbited this object uh, for a couple of years, to, to, between 2014 and 2016, uh, before settling down on the comet. So, so what is a comet? It's basically a, um, a small solar system body composed of ice, dust and rocky particles and in the actual the word comet originated in uh, ancient greek uh, for um it meant long hairy star now the, the nucleus is typically one to ten kilometers across and it's also regularly shaped as you can see with 67p looks a bit like a, a duck like a duck a duck <laughs> yeah so um comets generally form beyond jupiter where it's uh, quite cold and icy as opposed to the asteroids um where the asteroids a bit more uh, iron and stone um but um you do get the transition objects as well so you get asteroids that start showing cometary features and and another interesting object was 3200 Phaethon which um, is an asteroid, but it's in a it's in a cometary orbit, but it's also the progenitor of the Geminid meteor shower that we see every December the 13th. So it's obviously been around enough times around the sun to be completely made inert, inactive, but it's but it's still got loads of dust and rock in its orbit that always intersects the Earth, so it produces a very very nice meteor shower. One, one other interesting feature about comets is that they're very dark as well. So if you can imagine yourself on uh, sitting on a comet, yeah, you might think you're looking at some snowy mountain capped peaks, but um, unfortunately not. It's uh, very pitch black. It's as you know, about black as photocopier toner. Now, you may recall back in 1997, we had a, a great comet, Hale Bop, fly past. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, larger comets of recent times and um, that was that nucleus was estimated around the 40 to 50k mark and then and then recently what's what's made a lot of attention lately is this uh, new comet discovery um 2014 un271 uh bernard Dinelli bernstein which which is which is quite nice because it's it's got a human name to it human element rather than a, a robotic space telescope a robotic telescope element this this is the largest comet yet ever discovered, and they're and they're estimating it to be around 100 to 200 kilometres across. Wow. And that's going to that's going to arrive at perihelion in 2031. Now it, it might sound exciting, but unfortunately, it, it doesn't get any closer than Saturn. So I really wow. think it's uh, highly overrated. <laughs> it's basically. Um, it, it not only will it not become visible to the naked eye, it probably won't even be visible in a backyard telescope. Um, also, interesting is the the, the uh, comets are of quite low density as well. So there's an average of 0.6 grams per cubic centimetre. So um, a comet would actually float on water. So if you stuck if you stuck 67p here on the ocean. That. So the Pacific Ocean, you get a uh, a duck floating on the on the uh, on the water. So okay. They have, yeah, there have been um, over like four and a half, 
thousand known comets seen in the, since historical times. But it's actually a tiny fraction of what's actually out there, um, as a, and as opposed to the hundreds of thousands of asteroids that we've that we've discovered since. Uh, you know, asteroids are all pretty much within the orbit of Jupiter, so that a lot of them are in the Earth's vicinity. So when a um, comet um, approaches the sun, it develops a temporary atmosphere of pretty much uh, water and dust. So this photo on the right here, you can see that uh, 252p linear. I took this photo in uh, March of 2016. That was a three degree field of view. The, the coma was, um, was over a degree across. It was uh, quite large. It, it came very, very close to the Earth, one of the closest approach, approaches of a comet to the Earth. Uh, and it was actually visible to the naked eye as well. So it was uh, as appearing as a hairy star, actually. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. Now, now comas develop when when the uh, when the nucleus gets uh, within three astronomical units of the sun. That's that's what they define as an ice line, where where water ice will start to dissociate and, and um, yeah evaporate off the nucleus. There is there is um, activity from carbon monoxide um, when, when much further away from the sun. So but yeah, generally, and um, the, size, the size of a coma is typically one and a, yeah, 100,000, 200,000 kilometers across. So that's around the, the size of Jupiter, because Jupiter is around the 150,000 mark. But do note that the atmosphere is extremely tenuous. Um, so you'd barely notice the coma if you were on if you're on the comet. Uh, sometimes it can get uh, bigger than the sun, which is about 1.4 million kilometres. I'm not sure if you remember the uh, that uh, way back in 2007, late 2007, they had that uh, big explosion of comet 17P Holmes. That coma expanded out, blew out to a size bigger than the sun. Um, now also note that when uh, when a comet approaches the sun, the coma will also shrink due to the solar the effect of the sun uh, and become a bit more condensed. But comas are difficult to observe because you can see they're quite diffuse, so you need a dark sky to see it with, with much detail. Any sort of light pollution will, will make it a lot harder to pick out in the background. Now, the other great features of comets is that they can produce tails. Now, there are there are three types of tail. So the first top, the first tail here is uh, the ion tail. Now this was a photo of um, 2020 F8 uh, Swan. So this was my discovery last, my discovery credit last year, um, showing a beautiful, well-developed ion tail. Now these ion tails always point away from the sun, pretty much, because they're carried away by the solar wind. And they, they also develop when near the sun and they can act as a windsock for, for a solar study. So when, when, they, uh, when a comet gets smashed by, by a CME from the sun, it can, um, it can, it can swirl around quite, quite a bit and even disconnect from the head. They're, they're difficult to observe because they, um, because you're looking at fluorescent light and it's blue light, which the eye isn't very capable of seeing in the darkness. But it's also very easy to photograph. And iron tails can reach millions and millions of kilometres. For example, in 1996, uh, Comet Hikitaki was detected by the um, Galileo spacecraft when it was about 500 million kilometres away. So if you recall, Comet Hikitaki was an absolute cracker of a great comet. In, in March of 1996. So, so these tails can rapidly form and rapidly disappear. Now, a, a, a comet's dust tail is, is, is simply just dust escaping from the nucleus, because as you can imagine, the, the gravity of a comet is pretty extremely weak. So, so it's very easy for dust to escape from the nucleus. And, and the dust is usually left behind in the comet's orbit and often often shows um, curvature 
and it's affected by solar wind pressure as well but it's easy to observe because it's reflecting sunlight uh, it can reach millions of kilometers but but not as long as an ion tail and um, they're better developed post perihelion as as you can see here on the right um, this is a photo i took of comet neowise in uh, august of last year it became a very very nice northern hemisphere object in in july uh, we only saw the tail end of the show pardon the pun <laughs> um the uh, and and and, and, yeah, and they actually develop better when you have a peri a, a comet with a small perihelion distance because the closer the comet is to the sun the more it gets smashed by this by the solar heat pretty much and and the third type of tail which which you don't tend to see very often is the trail now the dust trail is is created by heavy particles leaving leaving the comet and, and they usually trail behind the orbit um, and they are often seen more in all cloud comets just from my experience so I'll give you I'll give you a couple of examples this was um, 2014 Q1 pan stars in July of 2015 they had um, showed a beautiful um, trail at right angles to the to the main to the main tails if you look you look carefully at that you can see the the bluish the thin bluish iron tail and uh, and also the dust tail in the same that same area but then at the 45 at that, then at the 90 degree angle you, you've got the trail trailing behind the comet and then uh, this this is a picture of um pan, another pan stars comet 20 2011 l4 back in back in 2013 that clearly shows the three tails um that you've got the very very narrow ion tail streaking pretty much up to the upper left about 11 o'clock then you've got the broader broader dust tail arcing yeah nice curvature there and then you've got the um that very narrow band of the uh, the dust trail shooting out to the left so that was a beautiful comet although that was, that was a twilight comet that was about it's quite bright it got to about second magnitude but but very low to the horizon so the, the other question you've got to ask is where are they where are comets from so it, there, there are sort of four different areas where they can come from firstly the short period comets they usually um have orbits of less than 200 years and and their orbits are elliptical and you you find this big population of jupiter family comets there's about 700 discovered so far they've got orbits of less than 20 years so you can imagine jupiter being a giant vacuum cleaner in our solar system it's um the, its gravity can trap trap comets um especially into resonances so you do get it you've got a cluster of comets in a six-year orbit whereas jupiter has a 12-year orbit around the sun so it's a two to one resonance and and the bulk of the comets actually orbit in the same direction as the planets so they're called you know, direct orbits and they're believed to originate from the kuiper belt um, and migrate inwards by the outer planet so the kuiper belt's around the pluto pluto region you know 30 to 50 au so this, this picture on the right hand side you can see where voyager one is at the moment it's around the 100 astronomical unit mark um and uh, further out you've got the Oort cloud which is a thousand to one hundred thousand times further away from the sun than the earth is and then for reference you've got alpha centauri way way out there close to the million million astronomical units so the other um well actually i should mention that comet halley is defined as a short period comet with a 76 year orbit but it's sort of against the grain it does have a higher inclination and actually retrograde so with so long period comets are defined as something as over 200 years uh, and they're thought to originate from the Oort cloud they're also um, bound to the sun in an elliptical orbits but they they can come from anywhere they have high orbit inclination and often they're retrograde meaning that they 
their motion is reverse to what the planets are. Now, I've also put a point there that they're active at perihelion. So this, this is an important point because I'm predicting, well, well basically, um, Comet Leonard will, will fits into this category of comet as opposed to uh, this category, the Oort Cloud Comet, where they're estimated, estimating about a trillion objects, but they're obviously way too faint and way too, way too small, way too far away to, to detect. Um, and, and the Oort Cloud Comets are located in a spherical distribution. So as I mentioned, a thousand to 10,000 astronomical units away. And their orbits are parabolic as well, meaning that once they come in, that you're only seeing them once, one time only. They're in and they're out. And and generally, it's their first encounter with the sun ever. So they've never experienced heat at all. They've been stuck at minus 250, 70 degrees Celsius, um, which which often, when, when they start to get anywhere near the sun, they start to show frosting. So they, they have this high activity when they're far away from the sun. So they give you that false impression that they're going to be very, very active when even near the sun. Um, but they then fizzle, they fizzle out, they disappoint. And one of the classic examples was uh, Comet Kahootek in 1973 was discovered um, when, when quite far from the sun, they predicted it was going to reach, reach uh, you know, daylight visibility, and it uh, it even made the press as being the comet of the century, and it ended up being the fizzer of the century. Hardly anyone saw it. It became a quite a faint naked eye object. It was it was a, a huge disappointment. So, so all cloud comets in general disappoint. <laughs> so this is where the Comet Leonard fits into that second category, not this third category, and I'll, I'll explain that later. And, and the final, the final sort of region where the comets can come from are interstellar comets. And we only have two examples of this, uh, one I and two I, and they've been discovered recently in the past five years or so. But as, as our detection methods become better and better, we will detect a lot more of them in the near future. So now moving on to our comet for the day, Comet 2021A1 Leonard. There's the uh, discoverer on the right hand side, Gregory Leonard. He's a professional astronomer working at uh, Mount Lemmon Observatory near Tucson, Arizona. Oh, geez, I wish I had his job. <laughs> he discovered this comet on the 3rd of January this year. Now this was the first comet discovered in 2021. And it was discovered during the first fortnight of the year. That's where it gets the designation A1. So, you know, any, any comets discovered in the second fortnight will get B. So B1, B2, B3. Uh, we are currently at um, T, I think. We're up to T. So we, I think we've had T1, T2, T3, T4. So it's quite straightforward. Um, Why did they decide on fortnights, Michael? Well, basically, you've got 52, 52 weeks, 26 oh, fortnights. 20, 20, yeah, fortnight. <laughs> and it fits beautifully with the alphabet. <laughs> so I don't think, I don't think you can get, I don't, I don't think you get Z. I think uh, Y is the, the last, the last one in you. So it fits perfectly with the, uh, so it makes quite sense. Once uh, once you get once you uh, if if you get a comet that's in a periodic orbit and it's and it's this detected um, on its second round in, it get it gets assigned a periodic number. So we're up to we're up to four hundred and fifty something at the moment. I can't I can't remember off the top of my head. So yeah. So even though I said so we so we had about seven hundred periodic comets, but there's four hundred and fifty um, that are permanently labelled. And of course, one P Halley is the, what's the first ever periodic comet, comet discovery. Okay. So, yep. So tonight, if you're, if, if you're um, watching tonight's um, live feed, I, I should have uh, Comet 6P Darest in view um, and 19P Borelli. So look, look forward to this evening. 
Now, um, so basically, this comet was discovered um, when it was greater than five AU from from the sun, so around the you know outside the orbit of Jupiter, and it was very faint at the time, but magnitude nineteen, so beyond the reach of most um, most telescopes. But, um, orbital calculations re revealed that it would become much much more interesting. So. This comet's going to have a close encounter with the sun on the 3rd of January next year at 0 0.61 astronomical units or 91 million kilometres. Um, and that's inside the orbit of Venus. Um, even better, the comet is going to have a very favourable approach to the Earth on December the 12th at 0 0.23 astronomical units or 35 million kilometres. Now, astronomically speaking, that's a pretty good approach, close approach to the Earth. Um, and not only that, the orbital geometry of the Earth encounter will see the comet at a high phase angle, which could result in a brightness surge due to forward scattering of sunlight. I'll explain that in a minute. So a combination of these factors could set the stage for the brightest comet to appear in southern skies since 2011. Now, this was a photo I've taken of uh, Comet Lovejoy in 2011, quite a long time ago. In my opinion, a great comet, I could visually observe the tail about 30 degrees with the naked eye, and even more with the with the binoculars. So just a bit, bit more information about Comet Leonard. It's estimated to be a few kilometers across, probably, probably four, four Ks approximately. Uh, it's also an all cloud comet, with uh, an aphelion of approximately 3,200 astronomical units. That's, that's, that's enormous. <laughs> it's a long period object. It appears to have been around the sun before, so 80,000 years ago. So if it's, if it's been around the sun before, um, this, this strengthens its survival prospects this time around because it's been pre-baked. It's been stripped of all these volatile ices, and it's it's not it's not showing this frosting. It's not appearing unusually bright at large distance from the sun as the pristine or cloud comets do, and usually fail once once they get closer to the sun. So so this so we, we're probably more likely to get a reliable light curve from from this. So. Uh, and do note that it's a counter after its encounter with the sun, it will fling it out of the solar system altogether. So it's basically gone, gone for good. So we do have um, JPL Horizons 3D orbit tool, which I'll show you later on at the end of the uh, end of the talk. How how bright will this comet get? So this this is the fun part of uh, comets, pre predicting predicting its behavior how how bright will it actually get but do note it's it is notoriously difficult but there is a bit of science behind it now the the amateur comet observer like myself uh, can contribute to the light curve which we see at right here so the the red line is um, the minor planet center predicted curve at discovery way back in january so it's actually doing pretty well to, to what the prediction was back then. Uh, all these black dots are, um, are the um, measures, a lot of them are CCD measures as well, but they're mixed in with a, bit of, with, with a lot of visual uh, recently. So the, the gray line that you see there is the sort of prediction for, um, for those visual observations. So you can see they're very, very close. And uh, so that you can see that the Minor Planet Center have predicted that the comet will peak at the fourth magnitude mark in uh, at closest approach in uh, on in mid December. Um, however, it's not taking into account the forward scattering enhancement, which I'll describe in a minute. So it's not taking into account this green line. So if you look at the spike in the green line, we're, we're going to predict that it's going to reach first magnitude. Now, also note the stable light curve. It's not um, it's not deviating from it, so it adds 
adds extra confidence to the prediction. So what is forward well, scattering? I'll just interrupt with a question we've got online. Sorry, before we move uh, on too yeah. far. How do we know that it's been around the sun 80,000 years ago? Is this orbital calculations and simulations? Is that how yes, we make these Yes, basically, basically calculated, yep. Um, you've, we've had nine, ten months of astrometric data. I see. So, and we basically, yeah, basically. So they yeah, position track for a period of time and then sort of extrapolate backwards. Yep, that's exactly right. Who does that, yep. Michael? Uh, Minor Planet Centre and the J and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. There's two different two different sites. They come up with the same answer, hopefully. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are, they're the two. Are. There's probably more sites, but they're the two probably the two main ones I would use to, to look at orbital calculations. We acknowledge a few other questions too. We'll get to those in a minute, but that one yeah, was, that was relevant. Get really quickly. Of course, Before yeah, definitely. Let you yep. move on. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> I'll do Sangulum, thank you. All right, so forward scatter, okay. Have you ever seen an airplane contrail at sunset or sunrise? And the closer and the closer the, the airplane is to the horizon, the more spectacular it appears. In fact, I've, I've heard of lots of people think they, they've discovered comets at sunrise or sunset because they're, they're, yeah, the trails, the contrails are bright and spectacular. So the same, the same, the same uh, feature applies with comets. Um, at small scattering angles, uh, you know, micron-sized comet dust particles can scatter uh, sunlight hundreds to thousands of times more strongly than at a side angle. The larger the angle, up to a maximum of 180, which is where you actually staring at the sun, the, so yeah, um, the more in line the comet is with the sun. Um, and the other very interesting thing is it's a log scale. You will see exponential rise in brightness. But that, of course, is offset by its proximity to the sun. Now, you know, Comet Leonard, the, the phase angle will be greater than 120 degrees between December 9 to 22, reaching a peak of 160 degrees on December 14. So just remember that date, December 14. So I'll give you some predictions. Now, many of you recall the Great Comet of McNaught, Great Comet of 2007, uh, which which sort of surprised everyone. It, it ended up being uh, visible in daylight in the, uh, about minus, minus five. Not that I'm saying that Leonard will, but I'm just saying <laughs> that this comet was visible in the daytime. But uh, the predictions there, didn't consider the forward scattering effect. There is a paper regarding that, so I've got that there for anyone that's interested. Now, with with this paper, um, the, the magnitude gain observed with McNaught, so you get a one order of magnitude gain when the phase angle hits 130 degrees. So Leonard will, will reach this on December the 10th. So we can we can predict possibly that the comet will be third magnitude by then, and then a two mag, <coughs> two mag gain at one forty five. So so Leonard reaches this on December twelve and seventeen. <coughs> so it could be twelve uh, second magnitude by then. So I just having a uh, <coughs> having a coffee now at one forty nine degrees. That's where Comet McNaught. Um, reached its maximum phase angle, and that um, that raised it by minus two point three. Now Leonard is going to go a step better. On December the fourteenth, it's going to have a maximum phase angle of one hundred and sixty. So technically, you you can get three and a half to four mag gain just on, on based on that alone. Now now obviously. This is dependent on the dust production of the comet. Now it's also a pre-perihelion encounter, so it's not. It hasn't. It hasn't been past the sun yet, so it's on its way in still. So that so the effect may be less pronounced. And it also assumes a base a baseline peak magnitude of fourth mag. 
Now we don't. Now the the baseline peak could actually become brighter than fourth mag, or fainter. But um, we're going to get a better idea of that in the next month. So so ask me the same question a month later. Now also it assumes a comet doesn't fizzle out. So comets are unpredictable. They can do whatever they want. And obviously it's not a, it's not very effective with gassy comets because it doesn't work. Okay. So this this is a photo I've taken remotely um, of Comet Leonard on the 26th of October. Now that's got a very bright nucleus and it's got a very dusty tail. So that tail there is about six arc minutes. So it is already showing significant dust tail development. So that's that's a very good sign for, um, for for the forward scatter brightness surge predicted in, in mid-December. And just want to mention some something else. The um, this comet will cross the orbit of Venus on December the 17th. It actually intersects the orbit of Venus. And this will occur less than three days prior to Venus actually being there in space. So it basically, it's it's missed Venus by four million kilometers, uh, which so so Venus is probably going to get pelted by by meteoroids from the dust trail a couple of days later. Will any of so, that be visible, Michael? Will we see them in the sky together? Oh yes, yep. So what? So basically, remember, next, yeah. Sorry, Michael. Remember, sort of a shoemaker levy where we can see little holes punched in Venus's atmosphere. I mean, it's probably not going to be like that, but is that possible? Um, not Question likely. without notice. No, not likely, no. <laughs> but uh, in, in my lifetime, I have seen a comet impact Jupiter in 1994. I've seen a near miss with Mars in 2014 with the siding, comet siding spring. And uh, this December, we're going to see a near miss with Venus. <laughs> so mm. it's merely a matter of time. It's merely a matter of time before uh, one's going to get exceptionally close to the Earth. And you basically you basically have that one-year notice. Yeah, so really it's, it's not – I mean, it's really obvious that we've been held at heaps of, you know, hundreds of thousands of times. It always happened a mere 20 or 30 years or so, you know, even less. Yeah. We do get the Leonid meteor storms every uh, every thirty three years or so, but the primary oh. body, the the comet Temple Tuttle, is what won't collide with the Earth in the near future. Anyway, not, you, not now. You saw that, Michael. I, I know yeah. there's a few other oh, astronomical society, South Australia uh, people. A whole group of us went across there to Sunset Country in Victoria, where you are. Uh, rented the little hut there in the Sunset uh, National Park and. Yeah, uh, there's a whole stack of it, and I I could not believe we were going to get up about three in the morning. But I think Fraser, who's who's on at the quiz uh, a bit later on this afternoon, was tooting his car horn, and we all sort of woke up in our <laughs> tents or swags. Out, come outside now, come outside. And I went out, and this thing went across the sky and just lit up the whole area, and I could not believe it. And after that, it was just literally dozens per minute, almost. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. I gave up counting a bit after two, yeah. after the two thousand. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it was, was, was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. But Venus mm. will get absolutely smashed. I can assure you. But we won't be able to see that though, not uh, unless they've got a satellite in space. But um, I think it's a Japanese satellite around Venus at the moment. Mm. But anyway, um, just finally the now the viewing prospects. So basically, it's restricted to the northern hemisphere for for pretty much all the way through to uh, mid-December. So just for our benefit of our Northern Hemisphere viewers, I've thrown in some a chart from the uh, UK from the December the 1st to the 12th. Uh, it'll be morning sky before dawn, and you'll see it yeah, so for basically from the start of December uh, at magnitude 6.5 and, and brighten very, very quickly to 4 or even possibly 3rd mag by um, by December 12. Um, you can see a very inter interesting encounter with Messier 3, the Globier cluster, on the 3rd of December. I've already booked my eye telescope time for that. 
And then something else very, very interesting is going to occur on December the 8th. It will, um, the Earth will cross the orbital plane of the comet. So what effect that has is, um, and only the Northern Hemisphere people will see it, you will, you will see the dust tail edge on, much like an edge on galaxy. So it will appear as a, a needle, you know, narrow spike, which, which might even be pointing in the solar direction as well. So you get what's called an anti-tail. So that'll be a very interesting feature. And that, and that feature will be seen probably a day or two either side of that crossing. So that's one one thing to keep a, keep an eye out. So I've booked my telescope time for that as well. Now, yeah, it does go bad for the Northerners from, uh, from say, the 10th, the 11th. It, it moves into the evening sky. And you can see it hugging, basically hugging the horizon. So it's going to be very low to the horizon in twilight going through a Fucus and Sagittarius. Um, so on the 12th, it'll be at its closest point to the Earth at uh, 0.23. And it will, and so we're basically potentially looking at a magnitude, a second or mag first magnitude comet with a, with a very, very bright dust tail. Um, and then just note, if any iron tail, I'm sure there's definitely going to be an iron tail with it as well. That'll be that'll be sticking up per, perpendicular to the horizon, so and that could reach, you know, ten degrees or more. So, so even though you think it's low, I would I'd still make attempts to, to photograph the iron tail sticking up over the horizon when when the sky gets a bit darker. Now for the fun part, the uh, the southern hemisphere, we get a fantastic view of it, um, all the way into perihelion. So um, our first view, this, this chart is from 35 south latitude. Uh, it's also evening sky. And um, so you probably look around the 10 o'clock mark, 10 p.m. at night. It'll be very low to the horizon initially, uh, but you can see that the visibility will rapidly improve each night. So from the 16th, put, put your diaries down from the 16th of uh, December. Uh, as the comet goes through uh, Sagittarius to through to mic Microscopium. So, and I'll sort of predict that the magnitude will possibly be around magnitude two with the with the forward scatter surge, and then fade to mag four by the end of December. So, because uh, due to the effect of um, the comet moving away from the Earth, as well as the 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 the, you know, the phase effect becoming less and less. Yeah. Um, Matty, um, I've got a question. Sorry, yes. I'll just interrupt there. I've got a couple of questions. We've got a few highs there from Paul up at uh, Mount Bryan, which is a good walk if you fit. Uh, Chris Wyatt uh, yeah. asked a question. Do we usually see anti-tails on comets pre-perihelion? So anti-tails on comets uh, before they they reach the sun, before perihelion. Well, well, obviously a tail a tail slash anti tail. Well, anti tails can only occur with dust if you've got dust in the um, in the comet. Uh, it's, it's it's merely a perspective effect, so it just depends on um, which way the tail direction is going. So, so you can. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers the question. But yeah, obviously, post-perihelion comets have have their tails have have a lot more dust released um, as opposed to a pre-perihelion. So it may not be as as pronounced as say um, um, comet R and Roland in nineteen fifty seven. That was a that was a post-perihelion encounter. The dust was far far more um, um, pronounced pronounced then. So yeah, that's a bit before, a bit before uh, my time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, long, long <laughs> yeah, take a look yeah. at take a, do it, Just do a search. Do a Google search, <laughs> Comet Aaron Roland, and look, um, we've, have, have a look at some sure of the photos. Got, I'm sure we've got some ASV members uh, that can remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So just, just try it. Just about finishing off here. Basically, the, um, so the other great news is that the moonlight the moon, the full moon, will disappear. So from December 21, we should be able to see this comet 
in a dark sky, well away from the sun, um, reasonably well developed. So it should hopefully, fingers crossed, be the uh, be the best comet seen in the past ten years for uh, for for the southern hemisphere. Uh, the northern has got um, near wise last year. That was quite impressive, but we missed out on on the on the big show of that. Just one other thing to note: comets are unpredictable. They can they can explode and break up. So any, anything's possible with this. So, so pretty much the conclusion of this all is, um, I'll, I'll put a quote there from David Levy. He was a famous comet hunter. He says, uh, comets are like cats. They have tails and do precisely what they want. But uh, I, I say comets, like cats, are predictable to a certain extent. Well, I've got a couple of... Um, if, if you want to keep up keep up to date, um, I've got the Facebook page there. You don't need to be a Facebook member. You can just um, click on it and have a look. So I'll, I'll be posting regular updates and uh, seeing whether this thing sticks to its prediction or whether it gets better than prediction or worse. <laughs> That's a beautiful shot there. That I bet you that was taken down Henley Beach or somewhere. Henley Beach, like. well done. Good job, well done. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I reckon I've got. A, I think we've all got that shot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think there's one of our ex-members, bless his soul, Steve Cook, under that. Um, Absolutely. Just after, just after he had a swim, I think he got out of the water. So now we have another question there, Kathy. Yeah, from uh, Mark. He asked a bit earlier, but because we've got a few minutes left, I thought we'd try this one. Um, yeah. He missed Haya Kataki. He's just wondering if you could share your memories of that one. Oh, he missed Haikataki. Mm. Right. Wow. Well, guess what? I, I, I pretty much missed it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, only had, <laughs> I only had one decent night, pretty much. Um, <laughs> and I was very, very upset too. So it, it basically, um, the reason it became a great comet um, was that it approached the Earth to 0 0.1 astronomical unit, which is very, very close, astronomically speaking. And, and at the time, it underwent an outburst as well, which was absolutely brilliant. And it, um, but, but the only the only problem was it moved north very, very quickly. Was, the 23rd of March was probably the best night for, for Southerners to view it. Um, I, and I missed out on that night. I Because um, oh, I had a wedding to go to. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> never mind, never mind. It's a Saturday night, what do you expect? Uh, but I did see it on the Friday night, and I saw about 20 degrees of iron tail. But but basically, the following night, that tail had grown to 50 degrees, and wow. then 100 degree, and then 100 degrees the day after that. So it was, um, yeah. It, it uh, as as I said, with iron tails, iron tails can rapidly grow and rapidly disappear. So it, there's there's all potential for for um, for Comet Leonard to develop a similar. Length of iron tail? No, no, no. I, should, no, I don't want to stick. <laughs> I don't want to put my foot in it and say we're going to see a massive iron tail. But anything's possible <laughs> if you don't look. If you don't look, you'll never know. So the whole the whole basic principle of all this is to actually go out every possible night that you can to to look at this thing because because it's going to it's going to change uh, very quickly. It will be. It will appear very different every night. So that's that's one of the most mm. fun things about comets. I remember Bill Bradfield uh, making a comment to me once uh, many years ago about comets or finding comets. He said to me, "John, you won't find a comment a comet watching TV." He actually said <laughs> that. So yeah, exactly. Uh, that's. Uh, I remember him saying that. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, um, I think we're just about wrap up there. We've got uh, lots of thanks online. Great talk, fantastic talk. So thanks very much, Michael, for sharing that. I'd like to remind everybody to get your app at nine o'clock tonight, um, and you can just go to the ASV homepage, click on the links, and buy your tickets there. So uh, we've got a few hours left, and we'll keep plugging them for the next show. So we'll see you back here in roughly an hour, I think, uh, with the quiz. So you've got an hour to study up and I don't know, check the latest uh, quiz questions online, Google it, whatever you have to do. And
and we'll be here waiting for you in about an hour's time. So on behalf of the Astronomical Societies of both Victoria and South Australia, thanks for joining us for this stream and we'll see you soon for the quiz. See you later. Bye. See you, Matty. Yeah. Mr. X. <laughs> Mr. X. That's right. Yeah.